go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Ask Anything brought to you by Mosher Consulting. I'm your host, Angel Leon, Mosher's Director of Personnel. We're thrilled to have you with us uh, for this episode of Ask Anything because today we're talking about guerrilla marketing, a marketing strategy that uses unconventional methods to attract customers and promote a product or service. And with me today to talk about this strategy is Melinda Lauder, Motion's Director of Marketing and Sales. Melinda, welcome back to Ask Anything. I have to say, you always, always bring up topics that are different, fresh, if you will. And this one certainly sounds different. So Melinda, how are you? I'm all right. It is great to be back here. I love being on the show. Happy to be back here with you on Hill. And yes, I love, I love this topic. This is something very near to me as a director of marketing and sales, but you know, this is, it's a little bit marketing-y this week, but I think we'll find that these techniques are not just marketing. They're just business techniques too. When I read what this was about, I, I kind of got on Google and Googled guerrilla marketing. What is this? I had no idea that this even existed. So let's start with what is your definition of guerrilla marketing and what makes it different from what we know as marketing? So this is really the whole term guerrilla marketing is based on a book from the 80s by uh, J. Conrad Levinson. So uh, he wrote the book Guerrilla Marketing. It really started, put a name to this. People have been doing this for a while, but it, it really put it a name to what this is. What it really is, is any creative, unconventional strategy that is really designed to maximize the impacts of your marketing with usually minimal expenditures. It really emphasizes the importance of imagination and even boldness over excessive spending. So traditional marketing can kind of be focused on just spending, right? Just putting ads on the internet, putting ads in any media you can think of, the radio, anything, and just, I'm going to do 10,000 ads over six months, and that's going to be it. Now, of course, you want to be sure that your ideal audience is listening to that network or that radio station, something like that. But it's kind of just a spray gun technique, and, and you just put it out there for traditional marketing. Yeah, it's right. almost so, formulaic. If I spend this much money to uh, buy this much time, across this amount of time, I should get this amount of responses back. And it is my absolute least favorite form of marketing in the world because it is very, very transactional. It has mm. no regard for imagination. It has no regard for creativity. And I have worked for marketing directors and vice presidents of marketing in the past who were all about this number for that number gets me this and didn't care about anything else. And I could mm. not wait to get away from them. <laughs> and that's traditional marketing. I mean, in the end, the creatives, yeah, the creatives got to be good. Your audience has to be good. But a lot of times it's just like, okay, take this creative and go place it in this thing and just do it. So where you're talking about guerrilla marketing, it really draws on the human aspects of marketing. And that's harder, right? That's harder. Not only is it more creative, it's just harder. You have to connect with the person on the other end of that ad and think about what they want. Ideally, that one client, that one relationship, it's based on leveraging that and trying to interact with that person. You know, I'll say this later again, but one of the things I always say is marketing is always personal. Doesn't matter if it's a million dollar marketing campaign from Coca-Cola, if it's going to be successful, it's still personal. When you see that ad, you have to connect to it personally. And they do a lot of research to make sure that happens. The book Guerrilla Marketing that's kind of started all this, or at least put a name to it, was actually kind of loosely based on actual guerrilla warfare. So guerrilla warfare in the military world, the basis of that is that you're going to use unconventional techniques to level the playing field between a smaller, less equipped force and more traditional large forces. You kind of think about it as, okay, I've, I've got this large force and then I have a small force that's trying to oppose them. The small force, yeah, they don't have as much money. They don't have as much men. They don't have as much backing or supplies, but what do they have going for them? They're small, they're mobile, they're quick, they're quiet. Whereas the larger one is slow to move uh, the communication is going to take longer. Uh, reacting is going to be slower. So what you do is you take 
your negatives and you turn them into positives. Translating that to marketing or to business, you're going to take your negatives and, and turn them into positives. The things that are important for this, I mean, you know, intelligence, feed, by intelligence, I don't mean the intelligence, the people, I mean, the feedback, the feedback you're getting about the situation. Right. You need a lot of that to make this work. You need to know where the enemy is. You need to know how many of them there are. You need to get that adaptability. You need to be able to change quickly. And smaller groups, like you can change really quickly a lot of times, right? Collaboration. I mean, there has to be tight communication and collaboration to make these types of things work. So this type of the guerrilla warfare type of it, it actually emphasizes self-sufficiency. It's very decentralized from leadership. Like it's very independent. The people who are operating in it are very independent and they have to be able to leverage resources very quickly, right? To work against the, the su superior forces. Again, using your weakness as a strength. They're large and I'm small, but that means they're slow and I'm fast. So, you know, strike quickly, do things that they can't do. But the important thing to know is like guerrilla warfare, that's that's not even the first time this idea was put out there, right? Over 2,000 years ago, uh, Sun Tzu wrote The Art of War. Today, that's not really used as a military book. It was originally a military book, but today it is often used to help people adopt different business practices. So it, that book has already been kind of translated into that. But what Sun Tzu said in The Art of War is fight the enemy where they are not. What he's right. really saying is don't compete head to head because you can't if you're a smaller force. If I have a force of 10 men against a force of 10,000, I can't go up to their gate and knock on the door and try to try to fight them, right? You're going to have to do something different. So fight them where they're not. You know, contrasting this with traditional marketing methods. I mean, we we kind of talked about that, but obviously probably lower cost, not always lower cost though. Sometimes you have to do this and, and it even has costs associated with it. People tend to think it's free. It's not always free. It can be. I mean, you could do something very creative, you know, pop out somewhere, but it, it's not necessarily free. It just focuses on being unconventional and creative. And, and it's starting to get a lot of attention in the effects it can have. So recently, uh, my company, Mosher, we sponsored a conference and I was reading through the prospectus from the conference, you know, as a sponsor, you get all these rules and all these things you have to follow. Uh, I was always curious and I always read through those, you know, I'm a rule follower, but I was shocked in the prospectus for sponsors. It said no guerrilla marketing very specifically. And I was just like, what? How could they stop us from doing something like what I can only guess happened is it kind of speaks to the effectiveness of it, right? Because if you think about that, you have these major, major sponsors at this conference paying huge amounts of money and they're doing the traditional marketing. I pay a bunch of money. I set up my booth. It happens, right? Right. So smaller companies come in and then they do some sort of guerrilla marketing, creative out there thing at the conference and they steal the thunder from these larger companies who are just trying to traditionally push it through right i'm making a lot of assumptions here but i'm assuming at some point that has happened real quickly what what would you say would be an example of that so sure. at a conference they're trying to do just your run-of-the-mill marketing what would be an yeah. example of guerrilla marketing in a conference so um one of the things we tried to do at for us at one of our previous conferences was we have a little um, robot that's our corporate robot. Mm -hmm. So we we were going to hide little um, keychains of our little robot all over the um, conference center and all over the hotel. And then we were going to, you know, say anybody who finds Robert, come back to our booth and we're going to give you a price, right? You know, it, it's minimal cost. We already had the keychains. It's the cost of whatever yeah. prizes we give out. But it, it's like reaching beyond our booth and it's, giving people a game to play and they did, they don't right. know what the prize is, but I really want to go find Robert. He's lost at the, at the conference center, right? That type of thing. That's just a little more creative, but it goes outside of your booth, outside of your area. Another thing we did that actually did disrupt a conference and some other uh, sponsors actually complained about it at the, the sponsor after meeting 
we had a tasting inside of our booth during some of the open conference hours. It was like a, a bourbon tasting. It was all run through the hotel that we were at, but we planned it ahead of time and had this really elaborate tasting with a bartender and these really cool Glencairn glasses, all this stuff. It was just very well put together, but we promoted it. Like we told everybody at that conference, we handed out little flyers saying, you know, this is going to be it. And we email people and everybody come back here at three tomorrow because we're doing this thing. And it was very popular. It was very popular. We would line around the place just to come into our booth and do this thing. Right. And one of the other sponsors complained to the, um, the management that the events in the conference center were over, were pulling people away from their event that they did with the conference. You used an important word uh, in your setup to that. It was disruptive. Guerrilla marketing disrupts what is expected, what is common, mm-hmm. what is, you know, just your run of the mill conference activities. And yeah, they weren't really happy that we were pulling focus from their event or presentation with this just little thing that was going on at our event. And why did we choose that? Again, information, you know, intelligence, yeah. the average attendee of said conference was a fan of higher end experience, like uh, bourbon, you know, yep. um, that was in a, what the profile of people that are going to be at this conference. A lot of them are bourbon fans They're like, oh, hey, here's an opportunity. And, you know, people make their own choices, right? But I highly expect that conference to also say no grill marketing <laughs> next year. <laughs> <laughs> So along those same lines, what are some of the key elements that, that, that make a guerrilla marketing campaign effective? It's really just about thinking outside the box, right? Thinking larger. If you're somebody who, you know, is capable of doing like the 50,000 foot view of something, like you're already on the path. The message should always be clear. It needs to be really simple, especially if you're disrupting, right? If you're disrupting the flow of something, then you need to be super clear about what you're saying and what message you are. And it really needs to take into account a deep understanding of who your audience is. It's supposed to be personal and it's supposed to touch people, right? So just like Brian said, it's like about, we knew this audience, right? We know our ideal audience in that space and that's who it is. And in that instance. And so, you know, we did something that appealed to them. Uh, that was, you know, a little bit different and um, kind of shook stuff up a little bit. Some examples of this being done, how I feel it was pretty effective. I don't know how it affected these companies' um, bottom lines, but I saw this one recently on a news article. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Chicago and uh, had hot dogs in Chicago. Hot dogs in Chicago are a big thing. Brian used to live in Chicago. Brian, what's the one thing you do not put on a, a Chicago dog? I mean, if you're willing to pay the consequences, you can put anything you want on anything. But in Chicago, if you put ketchup on a dog, you're going to get stabbed. That's right. That's 100%. You do not put ketchup in on a Chicago dog in Chicago. But a, a ketchup company this year installed secretly these kiosks outside of major hot dog restaurants where you could punch a button and get packets of ketchup. Oh. Because the restaurants weren't serving ketchup. They must have done some kind of research and said... But people like ketchup on hot dogs, right? Even if you guys don't like it, we're going to disrupt this. And we're going to like put in in these huge kiosks just appeared and you could punch it. It would serve you packets of ketchup when you walked out of the hot dog place and you could have your ketchup. So I thought that was a really interesting. It was just disruptive. They didn't put up ads about how, you know, you should be allowed to have ketchup, right? They were all in on it, really. And then one of the ones, this one was for more of a cause than an actual brand, but uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Wall Street, the big statue of the bull mm-hmm, that's on Wall yeah. Street. In 2017, this organization installed a statue in front of it called the Fearless Girl. It's this little girl who uh, is like standing up to the statue and she's like very fearless and has her arms at her side, you know. And it was just kind of done kind of in that gorilla thing. It just showed up one day. And so people were like, what, what is happening with the bull thing? We walk by this every day. That's not usually there. So the whole point of it was to bring to the attention, uh, the role of women on international women's day in the finance industry and all of those things and start a discussion about those topics. So by just having it appear and starting a conversation of why is that there 
they then started the conversation of, you know, the role of women in finance. And it was right. a whole uh, way to get the conversation started. And then, you know, this isn't just something for small companies either. Nike actually did some very successful, what I consider guerrilla marketing around the Olympics. This is when the Olympics were in London. Nike was not an official partner of the Olympics. Adidas won that honor. So that year, Adidas was the official Olympic partner. All of the outfits were Adidas. They had rights to mention the word London Olympics in all of their advertising. Mm -hmm. Nike did not. Nike created a campaign called Find Your Greatness. And it um, spotlighted athletes who are in cities named London that were not London, England. So London, Kentucky. And they would go there and film an athlete in London, Kentucky, who was a very good athlete and working. And then, you know, London, Canada and all these other places, they got the buzz about the Olympics. And it was a very emotional, personal story about the everyday athlete and all of us. Right. Right. And they got to sidestep all the advertising restrictions and, and, and didn't have to pay any of the um, fees associated with being an official sponsor. Yeah. Those are very smart, creative ways to get into a space without actually having the rights, like you just said, with the Olympics and and this Nike specific example. So kudos to those companies and to those uh, places that I I really like the one about the hot dogs. I love it. (laughs) And the ketchup. I love a Chicago dog and I don't have to have ketchup on it, but I just, I, I do like ketchup on my normal hot dogs. And so I would have Mm -hmm. appreciated it, you know? It's it's not about focusing on what you can't do. It's about forgetting what you cannot do and focusing on what you can do or what you could do. My favorite meetings are, well, what else can we do? Yeah. And then Melinda has gotten very good at recognizing the sudden glint that sparks in my eye. <laughs> Th- then I start off a sentence in my favorite way of starting off a sentence ever. What if we dot, mm-hmm. dot, dot, and fill in the blank? If you would have told me that that ketchup thing came from somebody out of New York just because in New York they love their hot dogs with ketchup <laughs> I would have believed it. <laughs> you know what it may have it may have done that it may be a little city war thing that I did yeah know exactly was going I, on that might not be a bad idea <laughs> all right so how can businesses leverage guerrilla marketing you've mentioned three examples here that across the board I think the Nike one really resonates with this question about what can they do how can they leverage guerrilla marketing Well, I know for a lot of companies, like if you're a small fish in a big pond, right? These techniques are important. You know, you you have to be considering these things. At Mosher, I know we're a mid-sized company. We're not small, but we're mid-sized, but we're in the technology consulting space. So at times we compete with the big four international consulting firms and those types of companies and companies much larger than us who who are not the big four. Now those companies spend a lot of money on promotion and advertising. Like if you do a simple search on like media radar, you can see that one of them spent a hundred million dollars in just in print and TV. You know, we can't touch that. We, we can't, if we were to go head to head with them, if we were to go, okay, let's do as much as we can in print and TV, we wouldn't even make it a dent in reaching as many people as, as they reach or being as effective. Uh, I mean, a hundred million dollars is it's larger than the gross national product of some countries. Right. So we just can't do it. So, you know, again, fight the enemy where they're not. So try to figure out where your audience is and then try to reach them in that space. It's a highly personal, highly specific. And I, and I think just moving that to business, you know, other business problems that you have, trying to think about them in different ways and trying to, you know, even if we were just talking about a go-to-market strategy for one of our divisions or one of our products, something like that. It's really easy to say, okay, this is how these other companies do a go-to-market strategy. But again, do we really have the resources to do that at our size? You know, we probably don't. We're probably going to have to be a little more creative about it and, you know, use some different techniques like this to bridge some of the gaps we're going to have. Yeah, that's, I think that's important because as you mentioned, you got to meet the enemy where they're not. And so if you maybe don't have the resources, but you use, to use Brian's terms earlier, you use that intelligence, that that little tidbit of information. If you do a little bit of research, maybe you're meeting them somewhere where they're not. And maybe you're actually 
you know, digging away at some of that market a share that you're looking for. That's probably what everybody wants to do right now is just eat away at market share in whatever industry you're in. So yep. that's that's what this is about. Yeah. Yep. And competitive research and knowledge about the people that you're on the playing field against. Another Sun Tzu nugget is know your enemy as you know yourself. The more yeah. you know about them, the better you can predict like, well, okay, we, we're reasonably certain of what they're going to do. So what can we do to either A, preempt that, counteract it, or render it as ineffective against us as possible? That's where you start your meetings. Like, all right, what can, what can we do in anticipation of this, in response mm -hmm. to this? They did the thing we were pretty sure they were going to do. We're ready. Go. That, that comes in the responsiveness, the nimbleness, the agility of being yeah. smaller. You know, we yeah. can't throw five, 10, $50 million at something. So we have to think more creatively in the way we, in our responses, in our actions, in our campaigns, our ideas to get as much reach and response out of them as possible. You know, you can get more out of a free idea or a $5,000 web video says the video guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if it hits the right spot and it finds the right audience and it takes off, mm -hmm. you can get more exposure from that than uh, any number of paid advertisings. Uh, I'm going to yeah. go back to Chicago hot dogs, yeah. Melinda. There is a restaurant in Chicago that's called the Wiener's Circle, and it is a hot dog restaurant. And it is famous in Chicago and outside Chicago for people who know it for being extraordinarily confrontational and rude to the people who come in. Back when Conan O'Brien was on TV with his show, he had a recurring segment called Triumph the Insult Comic Dog. Mm -hmm. Well, a hand puppet that was very abrasive, like a, a vaudeville, kind of almost Don Rickles comedian sure. insulting people. Yep. Well, the hand puppet made an appearance at the Wiener's Circle, along with a friend of the Conan O'Brien show, the actor, comedian Jack McBrayer, who is widely renowned as one of the nicest people on the planet. So the juxtaposition of Jack and Triumph being yelled at at the Wiener Circle and Jack engaging <laughs> Triumph on his behalf to yell back at the people who worked at Wiener Circle was a segment on Conan O'Brien. It got so much play from Conan's original audience. It was a web video that has been replayed. If you find it on YouTube, I don't know how many millions of views it has, but they could not have bought that mm -hmm. kind of reach with an advertising campaign. Yep. I'm sure writers for Conan came from Chicago or like, oh, we got to send the insult dog to that restaurant, contacted them. And they were smart enough to say, yeah, come on yeah. in. Yeah. What if they had said no? You know, it was just, you got to recognize these opportunities when they come to or reach out. Yeah. They could have reached out to them. And when they saw that dog and went, you guys need to come here. Like, yeah. There's yeah. nothing wrong with reaching out to say, if you have an idea like that, I'm crazy. I will reach out to anybody if I have a weird idea and be like, are, are you into this? Like maybe it could benefit everybody. Yeah. Not asking is this is the same as not having the idea to begin with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. If, if I have an idea and I don't ask, well, I might as well not have had the idea because there's no way we're going to do it. If you get the no, fine, but you have to take the chance. You're like, can we have this yeah. idea? Can we do it? No. All right. I'm going to tuck that away in a folder and somebody else is going to have a similar situation. And I'm going to pull that out. And eventually somebody is going to be smart enough to let us do this thing. Yeah. And then so, they will reap the rewards and they will deserve them. Well, this yeah. segues nicely into the creativity question I had up next, because we're talking about creativity and the creative ways that we've, we've described here that some companies have actually done guerrilla marketing as you mentioned, this was basically free publicity on a part of the Wiener, what, what is it, the Wiener Circle yes. in Chicago on getting on TV, getting confrontational, doing what they really do, just putting it out in a national yeah. audience. That's 100% authentic. They yeah. are who they are. It played on that and used something else authentic from the show that dovetailed nicely into it. It was an yeah. absolute perfect storm of circumstance that they took advantage of. To that end... Going back to creativity, what role does creativity play in guerrilla marketing and how can brands foster it? It is a critical part of it. You know, it's you, somebody has to have the idea or just feel a spark again that 
this might work or that how can we make this happen? But then you get into what, what does creativity mean? People get caught up on creativity and say, I, I'm not a creative, you know? So on season three of this podcast, I did do a whole podcast about practical creativity. Mm-hmm. I re-listened yep. to that last night in preparation for this. And, and I don't want to hash over all of those things again, but I do encourage anybody to go back and listen to it. And upon listening to it, I'm like, okay, yeah, that was some good ideas. So it just kind of talks about that you don't have to be an artist to practice creativity and how creativity can be developed. So, you know, don't get overwhelmed with, I have to be creative. I have to hire a bunch of creatives. Just kind of know that. But then touching on more of that, it's, it's really just about, again, trying to reach people on a personal level, right? Breaking through the noise. You have to break through the noise at the right time with something that resonates. One of the ways, uh, it was a a little bit creative, but one of the things we did at a place I used to work, I used to work for sporting goods store, shout out galleons, but it's not around anymore. (laughs) We used to get uh, marketing funds from athletic companies like Adidas and Nike. Those were very limited. So we didn't have a large budget of our own. One of the things we would do is we would create ads for things like boots, like winter boots and snow work boots and stuff like that. And we would put them on file at the newspaper. Back then, it was a long time ago. I'm old. There was a newspaper ads were a big part of our marketing thing. I think we also did with radio ads too, though, but they would just be on file with an order to activate the first day it snowed. So the first day it snowed in each market, they would pull out the ad and run it in the newspaper, or they would put the ad on the radio. We just had like a, a standing order for it. So, you know, it's easy to say, oh, it's around October 30th. It's starting to get cold. Let's go ahead and put our boots ads out. But it's another thing for them to go, oh man, it snowed today. And all of a sudden I'm getting an ad for snow boots on the radio from Galleons. You know, it's it's just more perfect. It's more touching them where they're at. And that was just working it out with within media outlets, right? That's all that took. Right. And, you know, once we got them to go for it and know we were going to, you know, use our limited budget in this way, you know, they were willing to help. We also had another one that was a little sketchy, but it was, we had a standing ad for workout equipment. And whenever another sporting goods store would place an ad, we would pay to have an ad placed next to it. Oh, that would be the basic definition of guerrilla marketing. You're just throwing yourself out there. (laughs) Like we don't want to run one unless they're running one. And if we do, if they run one, put us right next to it. So, yeah, but that's smart. I, I really like the one about the boots. That is actually very creative. Because you don't you don't think about it until it snowed and you have to get out of your house and you have to wear your boots, talk about snow boots, et cetera. Um, if you have those kinds, then you're like, shuck, you know, what am I doing? I don't have snow boots. Oh, here's this ad. And, mm-hmm. you know, for, for the young ones out there, um, you know, there's this thing called newspapers that uh, <laughs> used to run and, and some people still get them. You still see some mailboxes with the little thing at the bottom. They're going the way of the dodo more now yeah, and it's all a little bit. digital but back in the day that was a thing if you wanted to see a company's ad you had to get the paper or yeah. tv or or radio but really the paper i mean i don't know i used to be a paper boy way back when in the day oh, i yeah. had a huge paper route and I, I mean i had if i remember the number correctly it was over 330 some odd subscription to deliver every day and on wow. sunday it ballooned yeah sundays it ballooned close to 400 you know back then yeah. i i I made decent money doing that, but sure. that was it. Everybody wanted to see the paper. And then everybody had the paper coming around the holidays. Like we are now, like, you know, we're close to that point. People wanted to see the, not just the paper, but the advertising. And then the little sure. booklets that came on the paper, the Toys R Us book that came on the paper. And so, oh yeah, for Christmas. Yeah. yeah. So don't get caught up on the creativity. Like, yeah, yeah, it needs to be creative, but it may just be creative placement. It may not have to be some advertising some tv ad right it's just thinking about doing things in a more creative way i can't remember what watch company it uh it was but it doesn't have to be tv like you're saying it doesn't have to be radio it can like if you recognize like a a breakthrough kind of disruptive idea it was the straps on uh public transportation like the bars and the subway Mm -hmm. or on city buses the straps were printed to look like designer watches. So when you put your hand up through the bar holding it, going around the strap, it looked like you were wearing one of their watches. 
like that's that's way cheaper than a tv campaign yeah right yeah. Yep. And I mean, it's about knowing your audience. Like I said, like, who are they? Who is, what is that person doing? Like, are they playing golf regularly? Okay. Like, is that your person? Then leave your branded golf tells at a golf course or just hang out at the golf course or put a funny sign on one of the holes or, you know, make a relationship with the golf courses in your area and see what can be done. I was at a spa recently. It was my first time at that spa. And she's like, oh, you're a new client. So here's this gift bag. They gave me this gift bag just because it was my first time in there. I won't forget that. I won't forget that they did that. That's like just a way to reach me and to get me to come back. You know, the, the nail salons that have little branded Emory boards, you know, Mm -hmm. that you take out with you and you're like, you know, this person is into their nails. So they have one with your brand on it now, you know, it's just thinking about things like that. Yeah, it's like you said, thinking outside the box, getting sometimes even uncomfortable with with yourself, with your organization and making sure that you're doing the right thing by them, but also getting outside that comfort zone and maybe trying something that's different. I was scrolling through LinkedIn this week, and I don't know if you ever noticed, but the top right hand part of your LinkedIn feed is a little ad. Mm -hmm. I think most of us probably ignore it most of the time. It's like you're based on another little brand and it always says like, do you want to connect or we think this might be a good match for you or something like that. So I was scrolling through it and it caught my eye and it said, if you turn our logo 90 degrees to the right, it looks like a butt. And I went, what is happening right now? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was completely disruptive. It overtook my brain. I was like, I, I was just hijacked at that point. And so I, I had to know what it was. And it, it's actually a, a marketing company and I'm their audience. I'm a marketer who buys marketing services. They hit me where <laughs> I live, man. And I was like, yeah, if you turn that logo 90 degrees, it kind of does. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. I mean, that's the type of thing we're talking about too. I mean, they could have just put a normal ad on there. Yeah. Yeah. We think you should connect with this company, but um, they also could have fired whoever first pointed out, like, you know, if you turn our logo on the side, it looks like a butt. What an interesting observation. Go collect your things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But see, I, they turned a so... negative into a positive. So there exactly. you go. <laughs> could not believe Recognize it. the opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. Itself. And they went after it. So that, you know, kudos to them for trying that out and reaching the right audience because yep. you who knows? I mean, maybe that sparked an idea on Melinda that day when she noticed that. It's like, oh, maybe the motion logo should look like this. <laughs> it made me turn my logo to the side and be sure it didn't look weird. Is what sure. it <laughs> well, we don't want to fall behind in sales. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. All right. So before we go, how can guerrilla marketing techniques translate to other areas of business? This way of thinking can be used in other areas of business. I think it's just about reaching people and solving problems. We all have problems in our business uh, units. Our clients have problems, uh, speaking from us, that we're trying to solve and trying to solve them in creative ways, trying to think about disruption in the process. Mm-hmm. Again, like we can't always do things the way the, the bigger things do. We have to be more efficient and more creative. And it's about like applying those principles to our problem solving, right? Embracing the creativity, the practical creativity. If you go back to that podcast, that's really great. And just resourcefulness, resourcefulness, like what other resources can we bring to bear on this? Uh, You know, just like the restaurant with partnering with that show, it's, it's a resource they never would have imagined if that hadn't came together. And And it's really just about you know, thinking about your customer experience from a business standpoint for us, thinking about your customer experience and how you can incorporate some of this into their customer journey. This can lead to really delightful interactions if you kind of lighten up that customer journey and think about how to be more creative with it. I know recently our company sponsors our one of our local sports teams and has like a suite at that arena. And I know uh, our CEO's birthday one year, they sent the mascot from the team over to our downtown office to wish him a happy birthday. It's just those types of experiences and the customer journey. They didn't have to do that. Like that was a very creative way. And then, you know, when we, when it comes time to renew our suite, we remember all those cool things they did that Mm -hmm. interacted with our company. You know, we took pictures of the mascot in our office with our president and, you know, put those on social media. It was just fun. And 
the whole experience was very positive for all of yeah. our, all of our people. And it's just about thinking of incorporating that all the way through your customer's journey. Absolutely. I, I remember that day. That was a very cool day. So with that, Melinda, thank you so much for joining us again on Ask Anything. We certainly appreciate it. And we certainly appreciate you bringing these topics that are always so interesting. Thank you. Awesome. I love it. It was great to be here. And I think Brian was as much a contributor as me this week because we were on a true marketing topic, but I was happy to do it. Sometimes I just can't stop myself. <laughs> Thanks for listening into this week's edition of Ask Anything presented by Motion Consulting. We hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation with Melinda Lauder and her thoughts on guerrilla marketing. Be sure to join us next time as we dive even deeper with our resident experts and explore what they're currently working on. Remember to share your ideas or topics with us on our social media feeds. In the meantime, please remember to give us a rating and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcast. Until then, so long, everybody. Go. Oh.